vitro diagnostics for our synthetic nucleic acid products, but uh, the application in the mRNA field is really growing, and uh, I think uh, some of us, or most of us even, may have uh, noticed uh, a few press releases uh, in the recent months, and also the involvement uh, of the Gates Foundation promoting mRNA application and mRNA research. So uh, in order to prevent this tool uh, to the general community, uh, we want to be a, a provider that uh, offers these tools. Uh, the general uh, approach is to create uh, your gene of interest, which will encode the mRNA <coughs> in a plasmid, combine it with a T7 promoter, and uh, also combine it with uh, a poly A tail, so that uh, after plasmid linearization, you can uh, generate uh, synthetic uh, mRNA, which is uh, carrying a cap that can be introduced uh, during transcription or post-transcription, and it also should contain a fairly long and, importantly, free poly A without any additional nucleotides at the end. So you need some specific restriction enzymes, for instance, SAP1, which cleave next to their uh, recognition site. So this is a recognition site, but the cleavage is really in the poly A tail itself, so that not a single extra nucleotide is present in the poly A tail which is known really to be very important for uh, mRNA function. And uh, then, uh, of course, the length of the poly A tail uh, is important, especially if you go to pharmacological applications where variability in your compound uh, is not acceptable. And then, of course, the SAP1 recognition side, okay, it's seven nucleotides, but you still have uh, a rare ch chance that it will be present in your gene sequence of interest. You actually recently had one incident where a customer was asking for a specific sequence, and uh, so you cannot use it. And uh, if you use restriction digestion, you always have the problem that your cleavage is never 100% really, and a small amount of uncleaved plasmid template will generate very long transcripts because you have essentially a circular template and the termination is not at a specific site, so you will have just poor or variable background that you can poorly control. And uh, our standard approach is actually use uh, the cloned uh, plasmid but we do not include a long poly A tail because that's not also not stable uh, in proliferation in E. coli. Uh, we just have a short uh, oligo A sequence and we use PCR. Uh, in that case, it's indicated with M13 primers, but the actual primer that we use could be different. But the enclosed between the primers, so present in the PCR product, we have the T7 promoter, we have, of course, the gene sequence of interest. And then due to the use of a heel primer, which contains the long oligo T stretch, which encodes exactly the size of the poly A tail and hybridizes via a gene-specific short uh, stretch at the three prime end, we generate a PCR product, uh, which generates a, a defined poly A tail. It uh, has a free poly A end, and uh, it is not limited, of course, by restriction sites. And uh, also the PCR product that we generate as template can be analyzed in a reliable fashion, and we don't have the problem of uh, backbone background from the plasmid. For that, of course, we need fairly long PCR primers, and here I show just the mass spec as an uh, example, so that uh, these fairly long DNA oligos 
now with advanced chemistry, with, which is available from some suppliers, uh, can be really obtained in high quality so that the uh, desired quality of the PCR product is possible. And then, of course, we have two important steps, PCR for the generation of the template and the in vitro transcription uh, reaction actually to convert template to synthetic RNA. And uh, not in all cases is, is uh, working very well or uh, more or less ideal. Here in an electrophorogram, we see the desired full length product and we see a fairly large amount of smaller products which uh, are due to premature termination that the polymerase stops before it reaches the real end of the template. And we have modified the IVT reaction conditions, so starting from here, we could get to this type of quality, which is fairly reasonable. Uh, another example uh, is essentially the same thing also changing the IVT uh, method that we use. And in another example, which looks even worse than uh, the other two, we were actually working on both steps, uh, new PCR approach and new IVT. And uh, also in that case, we were not satisfied until we have reached uh, a, really, a fairly good quality of our IVT RNA product. This is just uh, the general workflow. So we start <coughs> with uh, the chemical synthesis uh, from a service provider and uh, we get uh, a cloned uh, plasmid product which where we make sure that uh, the insert is really 100% what is asked for. Here you see the PCR product and uh, the quality control by capillary electrophoresis. And then we use that for in vitro transcription. And then, of course, we can introduce a cap with cap analogs, or also by post-transcriptional uh, capping. And also at this step, it's uh, an easy thing to replace standard NTPs with M5C or pseudo-U which are known to uh, reduce uh, the uh, immune response, uh, that which is uh, important when you want to generate uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. Then it's important that uh, we really have only RNA, so that uh, the template uh, DNA has to be removed reliably, which we also confirm by RT-PCR analysis and after purification of uh, the transcripts, we analyze them also with capillary electrophoresis. You have seen examples before, and this is actually comparing uh, the slight mobility shift that we have observed if we go from completely unmodified uh, RNA transcripts with the trace showing in red uh, to fully modified, which contains cap plus the internal nucleoside modifications we get to this blue trace. And this is um, the workflow how we have established it uh, in the lab. Just, uh, yeah, that we have also several control steps which we call internal uh, process controls. And finally, uh, uh, QC before we release it and uh, also to uh, share with you some uh, properties. Uh, of course, uh, the standard is uh, to determine uh, concentration by photometer, and this is complemented also by at least uh, yeah, small uh, quality control measure with uh, 260 to 80 ratios, but uh, this is also not so widely uh, used and uh, also reached in uh, the, the uh, community or the different commercial suppliers. And uh, then we combine it with capillary electrophoresis to determine the size, and it's also complementing uh, quantification uh, because uh, the photometer uh, is uh, very dependent on <laughs> RNA confirmation. So in order to recognize 
obvious deviations, uh, the capillary electrophoresis is based on a, a different quantification measurement. Then we check for a bio burden tests so that our RNA preparations uh, have, show no growth uh, on a bacterial or fungal media and that also the endotoxin level is uh, below uh, determined amounts. We make sure that protein is absent, that we have RNA only, so that it's completely digestible with RNAs. And as I said already before, we make sure that no template DNA is left over with a potential risk of gene integration into the genome. <coughs> and uh, then we make sure that we really work with the proper sequence. So when the incoming uh, plasmid is analyzed, uh, we want to make sure that there was no mix-up. The final product is analyzed again, that uh, we show it should, it has to be what it should be. And then we also make sure that we have a pure sequence. So if we produce uh, several products for the same customer in parallel, we make sure that uh, if we have six different products, product one contains nothing of uh, the other five. And uh, really on a, a very sensitive level with RT-PCR detection where we can detect uh, contaminants in the PPM range. And uh, now I'll come to the conclusion. So this is uh, the type of uh, procedures and products I wanted to share with you. Great, thank you. Here you go, sir. Here you go. from the transcription regulation. Can you transfect these RNAs like we transfect DNAs into the cells? And what is the, the efficiency? Uh, it's actually uh, better and easier because if you want to, to do a DNA transfection, you have to get your nucleic acid into the nucleus. Whereas the mRNA, you only sure. have to go to the cytoplasm. So with uh, several transfection agents that our customers have tested, they found it much easier and more efficient than DNA. And the length of life, can you, how long it is? <laughs> um, that's sustained. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, you have the length of the poly A tail you can play with. Then you have your untranslated regions uh, before the translation start. And after the translation starts, the actual sequences uh, that you have in these elements can influence uh, stability. And uh, the stability that has been reached so that you have a half-life of about uh, 24 to 36 hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? I have one. Um, not, not in terms of specific names of customers, but you, can you give us an idea of who are your customers and has it, the profile changed over, say, the, the time that this technology has been available? Um, well, now really asking or answering specifically to the messenger RNA, uh, we have started that only three years ago. And uh, the hype uh, is, uh, has also started uh, about one year later. So the, the change in the customers is that we have uh, pharma customers and also big pharma customers uh, coming into play and uh, that also yeah, industry in general steps in, investors uh, step in, and as I had mentioned. It also has come to the, uh, uh, yeah, to the knowledge uh, and recognition of the Gates Foundation so that uh, this technology should be available to a wider base of customers. And uh, we have uh, three uh, key players uh, working on the mRNA technology, uh, two actually in, in Germany and one in Cambridge in, near Boston. Uh, but uh, they are very advanced. They produce mRNAs in high numbers 
but they only do it in-house. So no customer from outside can get a product. And uh, there are only really a very few auctions where a customer can come to a provider and I have this sequence, can you do it for me? And do it in GMP compliance, whatever is needed, and uh, that uh, we, gap we want to fill. And we have uh, customers uh, from uh, pharma, but also from universities, uh, and uh, also startup companies. Yeah. And uh, then the goal always is, okay, produce us uh, non-GMP quality in the beginning, but we want to get uh, high quality GMP grade material also finally, so can you do that? And uh, then it gets very, the options get very few. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.